Good evening. Welcome to Diversity TV. I'm your host, Mark Harris. Um, tonight's show is dealing with uh, what we refer to uh, in uh, the diversity field as invisible disabilities. Um, and I'll be introducing our guests shortly. Uh, but for those of you who are just tuning in, uh, if this is your first show, uh, here's what Diversity TV is about. Um, our mission is to illuminate everyday diversity issues and give the mic and the camera to those who don't always get it. And so to that end, uh, our se this is our second uh, season broadcasting, usually following the Lane Community College terms. Uh, starting October 3rd, as we always do, uh, with Native Perspective, then Anglo, Africans in America, Latino, uh, Asian, uh, GLBTQTS, which is Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgendered, Queer, Questioning, Two-Spirit. Uh, youth Perspective last week. This week we're dealing with disability. Next week we'll be dealing with class and winding up Season 2, Spirituality and Religion. Um, now, taking a different tack, I, as uh, having degrees in psychology and also being a black Indian I also look at the issue of uh, mental health in terms of, well, what is exactly mental health, but also looking at the fact that being a professional, and I have to confess that being a mandatory reporter, uh, I'm a mandatory reporter for a system that I would not trust any of my blood relatives to in this state at all. Sorry to say, even though I've been working in this field in this state for 25 years, it's you know sad to say that, having been working on these types of issues and encountering lots of discrimination that's endemic of, on lots of different levels. So um, if we go to slide again, one of the things that I teach in my ethnic studies class, um, historical scientific racism. So this is a quote from uh, Thomas and Sillen, who are uh, respectively psychiatrists and psychologists, African Americans, who wrote a book called Racism and Psychology and Psychiatry. In its long and ugly history in the United States, white racism has impri improvised a thousand variations on two basic themes. One, black people are born with inferior brains and a limited capacity for growth. Two, their personality tends to be abnormal, that's defining white people as a norm, well, whether by nature or by, by nurture. These concepts of inferiority and pathology are interrelated and reinforce each other. Both have served to sanctify a hierarchical social order in which the, quote, Negro's place is forever ordained by his genes and the accumulated disabilities of his past. The traditional corollary to these view, this view, say Thomas and Sillen, is that black people tend to function best when they stay in their place that is inferior to whites. Social tasks and privileges normal to white men are too stressful for the black man. Blacks living in unnatural freedom in the North were prone to insanity. Mental health was associated with contentment with a subordinate place in society. Protest was a, a sign of derangement. Now, the reason I bring this up is that these folks, some of these folks and the folks holding these views are the founders of American psychiatry and psychology. So when we start looking at, you know, I actually have a congenital mental illness from this particular framework, uh, being a descendant of slaves. I'm a congenital drapedomaniac, and I'll explain what that essentially means. Dr. Samuel Cartwright, a white Southern physician, coined maladies which afflicted runaway slaves. Basically said, drapetomania, the flight from home madness. That is, a mental illness that caused slaves to run away from slavery. In other words, you're crazy to want to escape slavery. Mentally ill for seeking freedom. Diesthesia Ethiopica, I, a.k.a. rascality by overseers, slaves destroyed property, avoided work, and raised disturbances with the overseers. So basically, there, on the other side, uh, there are a number of us who have looked at with the pervasiveness of hate crimes, 
uh, 10,000 plus Ku Klux Klan lynchings, church burnings, cross burnings here in Eugene, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we consider racism a mental illness. Uh, and so there's you know, a number of actually uh, European American writers that actually agree with this, Judy Katz being one of them, who identifies racism as a disease, a critical and pervasive form of mental illness. She says that it has all the classic elements of destructive behavior, including acting out, denial of reality, projection, transference of blame, disassociation, and justification. All classic symptoms of schizophrenia and psychosis. So one way this disease manifests, she writes, is through the delusion of white superiority. So despite the pervasiveness and perniciousness of acts of racism, such as lynching, noose hangings, hate crimes, the American Psychological Association has been highly resistant to classifying racism as a mental illness. So the historical record indicates the mental health field is clearly not free of bias and discrimination, certainly with respect to definition of what is mental illness or not, access uh, to health care, eliminating health disparities, and reaching those who are undiagnosed. The uh, recent Surgeon General report basically estimated that 10% of Americans have some kind of undiagnosed and therefore untreated mental illness, uh, begging the question of what effective treatment might be. Uh, it doesn't really adequately address toxic mental illness producing environments which are considered normal because some of the literature talks about, well, you know, if how do you make a successful adjustment to a society that says that you, you, you don't belong in society? So, and you know, we could also make a case for the mental health field also being unduly influenced by the pharmaceutical industry. Not that I could think that there would be a pill to cure racism, but science marches on. And uh, also civil rights marches on. So our guest tonight, uh, offering a perspective on what we refer to as hidden disabilities, is David Oakes, Director of Mind Freedom. Welcome, David. Thank you, and thanks for your work for decades now on diversity in our community. You're welcome. You're welcome, y'all. <laughs> uh, how'd you come to Eugene, and why'd you choose to live here if you're not native? Good question, because this is my 25th year here uh, this next few months. Uh, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, a working class kid. Um, in fact, a bunch of my grandparents and granduncles were coal miners, hmm. all of them from Lithuania, immigrant community. Uh, I managed to get a scholarship to go to Harvard. I went to Harvard in the 70s. I was very troubled, very, uh, very much th going into mental and emotional crises. I was diagnosed schizophrenic, diagnosed bipolar. <clears throat> so I ended up inside of the psychiatric institution five times while I was going to Harvard. Amazingly enough, I got out and volunteered to help with people in the mental health system in my senior year. Mm. And Harvard has a pretty good volunteer program, and they placed me in a radical program. It's called Mental Patients Liberation Front. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I wrote my uh, senior uh, paper about it. In fact, the storefront I walked into was called Vocations for Social Change, which is one of these early activist-type groups, and that literally became my vocation. I graduated, wrote my paper about it, uh, the experience of organizing with people in the mental health system, and uh, graduated with honors in 1977. So this uh, is now actually my 31st year. I mm. began in my senior year working on human rights. So when I, when I got out, I lived for a few years out there, but I've always been attracted to the social change uh, climate on the West Coast, the uh, counterculture, the uh, nature. So I literally, it was a very rational kind of thing. I just traveled up and down from San Francisco to Seattle and chose Eugene mm. and got here 25 years ago and immediately connected with the peace movement. Uh, such as activists such as David Zupin, yeah. uh, kind of a longtime activist, and just kind of instantly had a family, a connections, a, a people that were really supportive. And so I, I stayed here. Wow. <laughs> there wow. you go. Okay. <laughs> In a nutshell, as it were. <laughs> hey. So you come by, you know, all that work honestly then, so to speak. Right, right. right. With, you know, 
credentials uh -huh. from Harvard. Mm -hmm. I, I, I graduated cum laude diagnosed psychotic is one way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> Degree in psychology? No, uh, actually I studied government and economics. And, now uh, there's a case for insanity. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so people say, why, why don't, uh, do you use the degree? And it's like every day, but it's yeah. activism. A lot of right, people don't think right. of activism as a career, but for the last 20 years, I've been doing this work full-time, paid, not paid a lot, yeah. but I've been in, uh, this has been my job as yeah. a full-time activist for human rights in mental health. Makes sense. So your experience of the community in Eugene, geographically, environmentally, culturally, you know, and for, in, in terms of, finding fertile ground for this work. That's why you're here, huh? Right. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's a real uh, em embracing of, uh, of what was called the counterculture. In fact, before the show started, one of the folks here was, was talking about the Oregon Country Fair. Right, uh, right. Certainly emblematic of that kind of nurturance of uh, an alternative way of looking at the world. So you, the Northwest lacks, obviously, certain amounts of diversity. Yeah. Um, but there is that element of support for a, a different w viewing of the world. I mean, Ken Kesey was one of the supporters of Mind Freedom and our work. Uh, I, I, you know, he, he, uh, he really uh, was, is an example in One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest of, of what I think our spirit is kind of about, which is rebelling against the combine. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, unfortunately, have interpreted that as overusing recreational drugs. And right, I, you know, right. I don't do any recreational drugs. Yeah. A lot of us don't, uh, but we are into an altered state of looking at the world. And I think that that, that has a home here in Oregon. Mm. You know, you were talking about before we started with the show in terms of the origins of the word hippie, whatever, being you know, West African, you know, um, and also having a jazz derivation where a, a, a hep cat or a person who's hep it has their eyes open, as it right, were. Right, right. Um, yeah, I'm in the word origins, and uh, and that was apparently a word from uh, the the jazz in West African, hippie, hep a cat, hep all mean a person with their eyes wide open, super aware. Hmm. And that, became, that was part of the jazz lingo. So that is a very powerful social change uh, paradigm. Hmm. And it got co-opted by, I think, uh, uh, maybe uh, ec excess. You yes, know? Didn't right. a lot from the right. 60s, got right. co-opted by excess. Right. But yeah. Yeah. So what is mind freedom? And how and why did it come to exist? Well, there have always been people speaking out about mental health ever since the first person got locked up. In fact, I've been reading about uh, the 1800s had the Society for Friends of the Allegedly Insane. Allegedly yes, Insane. Yes, beautiful name, well yeah. thought out in England. Yeah. Uh, and it was a small group of people that were, had been abused in the mental health system. So, and there have been a lot of individual voices, hundreds of individual narratives by people who have been through the system. But it was exactly in 1970 in Oregon was one of the first uh, groups to kind of be inspired by the ferment back then, especially civil rights movement, but also women's movement, uh, environmental movement, questioning uh, science and technology. <clears throat> and so it was uh, the group in uh, Portland was Insane Liberation Front. Mm. It only lasted about a year, but uh, but that there was this movement. And so Mind Freedom emerged directly out of this. Uh, we started <clears throat> in the mid-1980s to keep the independent social change movement going, the MAD movement we sometimes yeah. affectionately call ourselves, that psychiatric survivors, mental health consumers, but also a lot of dissident mental health professionals, uh, allies like yourself in the academic and uh, social services communities and family members that, that feel there's really something deeply wrong with the mental health system and they promote alternatives to it. So this is actually a social change movement. It's little known, but it's like the disability movement or, uh, or any number of social change movement. It's, and it, it's been around since about 1970. So Mind Freedom came, direct, came directly out of that and mm. that we were trying to keep the independent movement going. And what I mean by that is that uh, the disability movement tends to be government funded because yes, we're mainly right, poor people. Right, right. Uh, huge unemployment rate by people labeled with disabilities, like 70%, incredible. 
So if you see a newsletter or a conference or an event or a, a center or, uh, involving disability in general, it's usually government funded. And we want more such government money. Don't get me wrong, yeah. you know. Uh, but there's a, there's a role for independent groups like a Greenpeace or an Amnesty International of disability and mental health. In general disability, there's a group called ADAPT, for mm -hmm. instance, and they're well known for doing civil disobedience once or twice a year. And they're an example of an independent disability activist group. And in our field, uh, it's mind freedom. Uh, there are now hundreds of people employed uh, in our field in terms of their mental health consumers that do peer support, peer advocacy. There's a drop-in center in Springfield that runs its own mental health clinic entirely run by mental health consumers. Uh, 230 Main Street, check mm. it out, uh, safe. Mm. Um, so this, this is now a career, but there's a role for independent groups like ourselves that are willing to protest, willing to speak out and uh, about abuse and uh, promote alternatives and not worry about the government funding being cut. <laughs> well, what do you see as abuse? Because, um, yeah. Not that we want to get provocative here, but uh, <laughs> you said, you, right. you know, before we got sure. on camera, you know, when I used the term mental mm -hmm. illness, yeah. right, because, you know, um, mm. that you dispute that term, or you have issues with that term. Yeah, you know, there's no perfect language. Yeah. A lot of people associate activists with political correctness. Right, you know? right. How many activists does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, the Answer, light, we, that's not funny. <laughs> that's the answer. Okay. How many activists does it take to change a light bulb? Yeah. That's not funny. Um, but not to be politically correct, but what we were looking for with language about us, that okay. is people who've been through the mental health system, is something that's inclusive. The term mental illness narrows you down to a medical model mm -hmm. where a doctor's in charge, there must be a chemical imbalance, uh, Maybe so there must be a chemical answer. So a lot of our members embrace that and find comfort and benefit in that. A lot of our members choose to take prescribed psychiatric drugs, identify themselves as mentally ill, but a lot of our members don't. <clears throat> so we're using words like mental health consumer, psychiatric okay. survivor. That means okay. somebody that feels abused by the mental health system. There's a lot of great English phrases, you know, just regular old English, such as a person with a mental health history. Uh, a person with severe mental and emotional problems. And so we're not trivializing okay. it. I mean, okay. for instance, a person with severe life-threatening mental and emotional problems or extreme differences. Um, a per uh, the technical term would be a person diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder. That's pretty neutral because that is what psychiatry officially does. They don't use mental illness that much in their scientific uh, so-called scientific uh, labeling. Uh, another one is labeled with a psychiatric disability. Okay. Uh, a lot of the disabled movement actually uh, has fun with this. They're using the uh, term dislabeled. We're the dislabeled. <laughs> dislabeled. Okay. <laughs> Which uh, the dislabeled and so I like that. Um, and you, you have the initials for the gay, lesbian, bisexual. Right, right. We now have CSX, which is consumer, survivor, ex patient, is sometimes used among some okay. of our radicals. But uh, whatever it is, just if, if people just show a sign, they're aware that there are a lot of people who've been hurt by the mental health system. And the medical model is the bully in the room at the mm -hmm. moment. It could mm -hmm. be something else. So the issue isn't the medical approach, but it is this bullying. People feel bullied by the mental health system, a lot of people. So if you use the term mental health history or mental health issues rather than mentally ill, uh, it's, it's more embracing. Segregation is the key issue, just like it is with a lot of social change movements. A core issue is segregation saying that group over there is somehow fundamentally different, down to their essence, down mm. to their genes, their chemistry. Um, very, yeah, very similar to what I was basically talking about at the beginning, you know. Exactly. But transported yeah. into a different realm. You know how you can quickly uh, turn the tables is yeah. just refer to societal illness. Mm. Is, uh, yeah, you know what, there's an illness, a societal sickness of violence. We have a the USA has a sickness in its soul of violence. Uh, so we'll, if you, you, don't want to use the, you want to use the word illness, let's play with it. But it's more metaphoric. Uh, and the human race has some 
problems of a sickness in our soul that we are rest that we've been wrestling with with for thousands of years. You know, it's a human issue. So, uh, so anyway, uh, there's no perfect language, but mental health consumer, psychiatric survivor, that works. <laughs> CSX, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, I guess having having the training and being in practice, and you know, dad's a shrink, and dad's probably watching now. He's in town, so. Uh -huh. Um, you know, we've often had these debates, you know, so mm -hmm. in terms of looking at, you know, a culture of pathology, you know, is society, is society well itself, you know, <laughs> certainly uh, when we had Martin on last week and we were talking about youth oppression issues and one mm -hmm. of the things that I had gotten particularly outraged in the last couple of weeks, you know, on, on my addictions class and well, the concept that how do you diagnose a three-year-old as bipolar? That's one. <laughs> right. And then propose treatment. Like, so how is a three-year-old right. bipolar unless okay, the kid's being abused, which then Prozac is not going to, <laughs> or right. Lexapro or whatever, is not going to fix the abuse. Yeah. Then the problem isn't the kid's bipolar. That's a response to a toxic environment. And why aren't mm -hmm. we focusing on the abuse? You know, mm -hmm. like PTSD is attempting to make a, I hate to use the language because it's language problematic, a sane adjustment to watching your friends get blown up mm -hmm. or, you know, having near-death experiences in combat and then, you know, adjusting to civilian society and then having flashbacks, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's the people have had experiences happen to them, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, we're trying, they're trying to make, a sane adjustment, if you will, to an insane situation mm -hmm. or a situation that is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess one of my pet sayings is pills are not skills. Mm -hmm. And so that in order to, you know, in a dearth of skill building in terms of dealing with difficult mm -hmm. issues, experiences, whatever, uh, pills are limited in what they can do. And mm -hmm. so I think when I talked about, you know, earlier in the show about mm -hmm. that un undue influence by the pharmaceutical industry where, mm -hmm. you know, we're trying to find uh, disease or making up diseases practically to find pills, you know, restless mm -hmm. leg syndrome, mm -hmm. you know, social anxiety disorder. Now, yeah. I deal with people, of course, who, you know, have mental, mm -hmm. uh, mental illness labels or mm -hmm. whatever. And, Right. Yeah, they are agoraphobic, or they are they do have anxiety disorders, or they, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. you know, I do, you know, have a professional responsibility. To look, okay, you can't use pot on top of your meds or drink <laughs> on top of your meds, you know, if, mm -hmm. if you have a co-occurring disorder, you know. Mm -hmm. So I have to be socially responsible. But mm -hmm. I'm also about teaching skills to folks that... Um, need them. So what are some of the, th the key issues that your constituents work on? Well, you've nailed one, which is our priority campaign right now, which is that youth are in the crosshairs of the mental health system right now. Yes, we are seeing three-year-olds. We're seeing two-year-olds being put on the kind of drugs that I used to only see in the back wards. Uh, in the 1950s, these are the Thorazine-type drugs. Uh, Thor I've, I was on Thorazine two Health. Two-year-olds on Thorazine? We are seeing two-year-olds on, on neuroleptic drugs. Those are the, the, the family of drugs are known as neuroleptics right. uh, or more commonly antipsychotics, but really a more neutral term and scientific is neuroleptic. I was on Thorazine, Stelazine, Haldol, Melaril. Now there are newer ones like uh, uh, there's uh, drugs such as Abilify mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, Clozapine and Risperdal and Zyprexa. So these are the nukes of psychiatry. And, and it's important when, you, when, I, when we address these issues to point out that this is not a civil war be, pro or con drugs. This is more complex than that. This is a nonviolent revolution in the mental health system. In fact, that's in our mission statement. Okay. Is a is a nonviolent revolution in the mental health system because some of our members choose to take prescribed drugs. And what's happened is that when we approach the problem of the drug companies, we get pigeonholed as just being, oh, you're just anti-drug. And it's way more complex than that. When, you, when people are giving three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds these super powerful drugs, 
there is a real natural revulsion, and there ought to be. I mean, right. this is really bad. But remember, like uh, 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 the Mother Jones uh, recently had a front cover story about a non-drug alternative that they exposed. There's a center in Massachusetts that advertises we don't give those we don't give toxic drugs to kids. They're using aversive therapy. They're using straps on the arms, uh, legs, and abdomens. The guards literally carry around the button. Uh, and, and that wirelessly can zap them. Some of the kids have had hundreds or thousands of very painful zaps. The reporter said that it wasn't just like a hornet sting, it was like a swarm of hornets attacking, is how it felt. Uh, and so this is torture. This is mm. Abu Ghraib style torture, no drugs involved. So there's something <laughs> deeper. Aversive in, there's some, therapy. Yeah, mm. there's, there's something deeper involved. In, uh, 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 in this, and so the th we focus on human rights instead of getting stuck in the pro or con. So, what is it about a kid who's getting drugged that is really wrong? The three, the three kind of main human rights areas that we focus on on the invisible disabilities, is uh, really simple. It's a force, fraud, and fear. Okay, okay. just real simply put, because okay. and these are international human rights. Uh, promises from the United Nations that the U U.S. has signed off on is that we all should have these rights. Uh, force, uh, you asked about abuse, we have fought a number of forced electroshocks still going on to this day mm -hmm. where people are dragged down the hall against their will for zapping. Um, this is a worst case scenario. So forced treatment, especially with these intrusive uh, procedures, really, really bad. Fraud is lying to people. I mean, there are ads on TV telling people that these drugs fix a chemical imbalance. Right. You know, they show a little bouncing ball. Right. Right. Total, no proof. These, right. are, these, are, these are theories. So we are lied to. They cover up the fact that long-term neuroleptics can cause brain damage. Right. I mean, shrinkage of the frontal lobe. Organicity, definitely. Definitely. Sure. So yeah. the, the, the big one, though, is, is fear. And that's how they're getting a lot of these families. Like the family that's being that's drugging that three-year-old is probably a loving family, but they've been told there's no alternative. Uh, we've tried talk therapy. Well, that would be a lie too. And there's but, no alternative. Yeah, right. It's it's another lie, but it's 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 there is an element of truth that our society tends not to provide a range of alternatives. Uh, if you're a teenager who hears voices, right? Classic so-called schizophrenia. You have to be in Finland to get a non-drug uh, approach from, from the government. They have a process there called open dialogue where they send out a team to talk with the family at length and the, and the individual to try a non-drug alternative when you're labeled uh, schizophrenic. Why do you have to be in Finland? And, mm. and a real revealing thing in terms of diversity is that your best chance of a, a full recovery after being labeled schizophrenic like you're hearing voices that you know, other people don't hear that are distressing or you're hurting yourself or whatever, your best chance of full recovery, that is you're reintegrated to family, work, environment, uh, is in a poor developing country with the least psychiatrists, least psychiatric drugs. <laughs> the World Health Organization did this as a big study <laughs> and they went and did it twice because it was so mind blowing. Uh, and you know, a lot of practitioners don't even acknowledge there is such a thing as full recovery. See, this, this particular label is different than, say, severe Alzheimer's. Not many severe Alzheimer's folks, you know, turn around and right. are, you know, playing chess. But a lot of people labeled full, you know, extreme schizophrenia, bipolar, have fully recovered. And just that fact is kind of revolutionary. Mm. So, you know, to go back to your In question. In these countries without pharmacological interventions, yeah, talking the, cures, etc. And et there's, there, are, there is recovery. I mean, I hope I'm considered one. <laughs> I was labeled schizophrenic, bipolar by a dozen psychiatrists. Um, so there is recovery. Um, and uh, the, that three-year-old, though, that you're talking about, <clears throat> the family isn't being offered uh, alternatives. Right. Also, a lot of young people are in foster care, and that's where you and I are the mm -hmm. parent, and that, mm -hmm. I feel, is just way wrong because with most kids, the parents do have a lot of authority, for better or for worse, but foster care, they are drugging the heck out of foster care kids. 
just enormous amount. I mean, uh, we uh, here in Lane County remember Bobby Jackson. Yes. See, we don't right. we don't know our history here, but Bobby Jackson, seven year old, you remember him? He ran home from school and uh, died. Why? Because Dr. Sue Calacerto, who's a psychiatrist here, prescribed him a ton of drugs. The biological mom was begging, you know, please don't don't do it. Uh, Bobby had been taken away from the biological mom because she did recreational drugs, ironically enough, and he died. Yeah. Uh, so that would be an example yes. of... Uh, you and I were the parents on that. The we state. were parents yes. of Bobby. Okay. And, uh, there is a Bobby Jackson law, by the way. Right. Anybody out there with, with a kid in foster care, you can now, because of Bobby, go to a judge uh, and, compl and you, you, a biological parent has a right to complain about their kid being drugged in foster care. I don't know how many people use it or even know about it. Well, but, where you know. is the doctrine of informed consent? I mean, so, you know, when I do trainings for the state of Oregon for, you yeah. know, the mental health and addictions office, you know, we talk right. about, you know, the doctrine mm -hmm. of informed consent where you have the right to get, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not the force of law, but it's supposed to be professional ethics where right. you talk about the pros and cons of any particular course of therapy, drug or mm -hmm. otherwise. Right. So... Well, we're, we have fought on informed consent here in Lane County for decades, probably more than just about any other county. We have improved Sacred Heart's informed consent sheet on electroshock. Sacred Heart does electroshock. A lot of people don't know this. They have done shock. and Don't do and, abortions. Do do <laughs> right. okay. And we could do a whole show on 20 years of little changes over the years with their informed consent. It's still not what we want. Uh, and then Lane County, we wrestled with them about what they tell people when they give people these super powerful drugs, like the neuroleptics. And this is the mental health system's greenhouse effect. Mm. Because, I mean, yeah, there's a whole bunch of effects. I mean, for instance, Zyprexa can lead to diabetes, and a lot of our members choose to take right. it anyway, you right. know. And that's just like we have uh, our board president is diagnosed uh, with breast cancer. She takes anti-cancer drugs that are dangerous, right? But you have to warn people, right? Right. N no system warns people that taking neuroleptics over a long period of time, uh, you can get shrinkage of the frontal lobes. Okay. okay. Now, that is the greenhouse effect of the mental health system because diabetes, you know, you could go, hmm, diabetes, mental well-being, right? What is the risk-benefit <laughs> ratio here? But what am you I, can, you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, can, you can kind of think about it, yeah, you know? Right. But when you don't tell people that their frontal lobes shrink, and, and this stuff is nailed. Well, explain what that would, what, what that would do. I mean, <laughs> if, you warn, if you warned a lot of people, a lot of people would still choose to take the drug. Yeah. Um, because Foresight, the, planning. They, they just go, you know like what, that. I mean, I know people that have thought about it and just decided that they're going to go the drug route. But when you don't warn people uh, and you cover it up, and, uh, and so just like the greenhouse effect, the system's fighting back by saying, well, uh, you know, it must be the underlying mental illness uh, is causing the brain shrinkage. But mm. I just need to then Wait fight back minute. against the fog here yeah. because uh, we're talking brain scans, we're talking autopsies, but animal studies, that's what nails it. There's a new animal studies, animal study with primates that shows an 8% reduction of the frontal lobes after two years on neuroleptics. Okay. And I have to always say we're pro-choice. We're not saying that we're anti-drug. But when you give a drug that literally, no joke, no, no stretching the truth, literally is a chemical lobotomy, and some people would still choose it, but when you give a massive number of people a chemical that can cause a chemical lobotomy, shrinkage, in fact, I would argue worse than the lobotomy of old because I've met people that have had cingulotomies, lobotomies, and it's a luck of a draw. Some of them you couldn't tell. But when you're on 20 years of neuroleptics, you can tell. Uh, it's, it really impacts uh, your cognitive abilities. Uh, and it could have been me, and that's why I kind of mm -hmm. hammer this. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a lot of this is about power uh, that that they're not uh, acknowledging uh, uh, brain shrinkage. Yeah. You know. So it's going to take a lot of people and organizing and critical mass to, just like with the greenhouse effect, to kind of get this get this knowledge out there in the mental health system. 
I guess you know because as you say, you know, a number of your you know, a number of mental health consumers still, even with being informed of the risks, still mm -hmm. choose to do that. Right. So I think then where we where we could be lacking is all right. What are the alternatives? Where is the skill building? <laughs> because certainly where I started running up against it and what started radicalizing me is basically running into lots of adults methamphetamine addicts who are medicated with <laughs> and you know Ritalin and <laughs> yeah, et cetera et cetera and the medical community being in denial about okay you're developing a tolerance and don't give me the f the idea that oh well it's affecting the kid differently before puberty than after puberty and after after they they become pubescent then they're right. not getting a tolerance for amphetamine right. well no <laughs> wrong that's not what the science is saying right you know, so essentially, now that you've medicated these kids, instead of mm -hmm. giving them the skills to manage their extra energy, so mm -hmm. my thing with that is looking at teach them a mind-body discipline, you know, right. a martial art, yoga, right. or something, right. you know, ancient disciplines in mm -hmm. societies that haven't been over-medicating folks, where yes. people learn to control their sensorium, control their impulses mm -hmm. internally. Skills, right. You're not exactly pills, right. pills. You're exactly right. right. And, and, and a lot of times when we bring up things like yoga, nutrition, meditation, uh, body work, and other holistic alternatives, we're poo-pooed and said, you know, well, you know, we're talking about severe problems. But there's, that's classism, okay? Because yeah, right. there are people in the South classism Hills. Classism are worse. It, worse, too. <laughs> but, I mean, there are people in the South Hills that are using meditation here in Lane County uh, and yoga because they're upset or worried or, you know, the greenhouse yeah. effect or their job, right? But, but a person who is homeless and labeled with severe mental and emotional problems and maybe suicidal, mm. things like yoga, exercise, massage, uh, and uh, meditation may be life-saving. They yes. really can make a difference even for severe uh, problems. This is what the city of Eugene helped us with uh, for three years. The uh, city of Eugene Human Rights Commission adopted mental health and human rights as a priority. What came out of it is the right to alternatives, the right to choice, because choosing from a range of alternatives is part of the recovery process. Right. We're not saying, oh, oh, the answer is meditation. We're saying that apparently being able to choose from a number of options is part of the recovery process because it Maybe involves even combining, you know, combining complementary this, medicine, whatever, including you know? the people on right. psych drugs. When right. you talk to the people who do well on psych drugs, that's one thing. They also maybe are on a jobs program. They right. have a good counselor, right. Right. peer support. They got some new housing that's good. Supported housing is one of the most proven, uh, helpful things for people uh, uh, with drug addictions and also mental health. Yes. Um, so the, in fact, I'm, I'll, I'll try this phrase out on you. I'm, I'm using the phrase green mind, greening the mind. Greening, greening the, the mind. mind. Okay. And I got it accurate, okay. David. Okay. It's like green mind when, when stands for holistic, humane, empowering, non-chemical. Again, hmm. saying, okay. look, we're not okay. saying that we're anti-drug, but just that, but, but that's the that's the bully in the room right now mm -hmm. is is drug 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 is what you get ryan salisbury was killed uh not too far from here he's a 19 year old from a very well-off family i went yes, by the right. house have you been in that area it's like this yeah. huge mansion yeah, hawkins is that where it's, it was? it's yeah. way up hawkins yeah, right. it looks down a little valley beautiful uh mansion a type of house and that family uh, had resources for a year and a half, yeah, they had a right. suicidal 19-year-old, and what they were offered, after I've talked with the family, they were offered three drugs. He was on, finally, a neuroleptic in the last few days before he uh, died, and one hour a week, kind of, that kind of talk therapy, maybe maybe more, I don't know, but traditional talk therapy, and, you know, you, you turn on TV and you see Super Nanny or Nanny mm -hmm. 911. Mm -hmm. Hell, that's more than what we have. Mm -hmm. The Kinkle family... Uh, Kip Kinkle was the yes, uh, right. murderer and uh, Thurston. School shooter. School Thurston. shooter. Yeah. They were leaders in the community. They were desperate for help for Kip, for Kip. They were offered that little tiny pallet, you know, of uh, drugs. They didn't want that, talk therapy. And like in Finland, they send in a whole team to meet with you and your extended network extensively for weeks, hours, months. I'm not saying that's the answer, right. but yeah. this like idea of 
choice so that a family in distress in the richest country in the history of the planet you know deserves and even people with resources ha these are folks with resources yeah. see people uh, the UN uh, says we have the right to the amount of income so we can buy health services but how do you buy health services that aren't there yeah you know how do you go yeah. out and find if you have a kip how do you go and get some at-home uh, visits from really good uh, counselors to stand up to his bullying he was bullying the family and uh, how do you how do you how do you get that you know I mean wh what number do you dial yeah. if you go to the traditional mental health system those though it'll be drug 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 traditional talk therapy uh, and I, I don't want to I, I know there's there are other people out there doing alternatives I don't want to say everything is is bad but there's a that's why our campaign is called voices for choices just get the voice of people out there been through the mental health system to say we want a range of alternatives a range of choices we have a right to that uh, and uh, who knows Ryan might it might be alive uh, if that had happened everyone's focusing on the second that he ran out of that house with a knife right but what about that 18 months we had a chance you know we had a chance as a society for this uh, amazing youth leader we blew it you know and I think with well with both those two examples I mean we're not necessarily looking besides the bully in the room we're also not looking at um, some of the destabilizing influences you know because for example first-person shooter games things on the internet you know mm -hmm. the pervasiveness yeah. of violence that's you know the normalizing aspect of violence whether it's television video games right. etc etc yeah I mean that's destabilizing too and we've accepted that as a norm right? exactly and, and so yeah. how do you counter that because mm -hmm. I mean those are relatively recent mm -hmm. developments in terms of human history in terms of looking at uh, yeah what is what is mental? Okay, so if you don't, you know you're dis, you have difficulties with a mental illness. What's mental health then? Right, mental wellness. You know, let's talk about mental wellness because then you are talking about the whole society. Hmm. What a lot of what we're dealing with is they're saying, oh, it's about that five percent of seriously mentally ill, or the twenty percent that would be labeled or. One study showed 45% of the public in any given year would get a psych label, you know. So they say, oh, it's about them over there. And it's like, you know, our societal violence, the way we treat our environment, that's universal. Mm -hmm. there, we, are, we are universally of, uh, confronting distress. This is something that we're all, uh, that we're all involved in. So it, one of the most useful things people can do is to take this out of the realm of just talking about that person over there with the extreme problem and for us to get have democracy to get hands-on with mental and emotional well-being to say just you know 20 years ago 30 years ago land use planning that was Greek to most people mm -hmm. urban growth boundary mm -hmm. you mentioned that someone mm -hmm. when when we got the to town right. what urban growth boundary now you know, the public is like yeah okay I can talk about transportation policy urban growth policy uh, you know these complicated topics but society still, when it comes to mental and emotional well-being, it's like, oh my God, ah, that's the experts. Yeah. Give it to the, give it to the psychiatrist. If we got hands-on, we'd see that, you know, like what we're doing right here, even just communicating and conversing about something really important. Even that isn't done a heck of a lot in our society. True. You know, we're like, uh, we're we're in, behind the screen. You know, we're, we're, we're behind the computer screen. We're behind the, the screen of our car. We're behind the... Com right, we're, we're not doing face-to-face. -face. We're not doing, we're not, you know, we don't yeah. even know our neighbors kind of cliche. Right. So that is a well-being issue. Um, and, and so I, 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 I like that because that flips it over and it's like this is a mainstream issue. This is about, it, that's why I say, Mar, uh, the, uh, you mentioned that I, I say, my favorite mental health movie is Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth because, <laughs> you know, we, we hunger for data and science. Yeah, and right. It's like, go see that movie. You want numbers? Go see the Al Gore movie. You walk out and you go, guess what? None of this is normal. I mean, what is called normal is perhaps one of the worst soul sicknesses known to humanity. And I... The word soul sickness, that's the word origin for psychosis. Mm. You, you are talking to a diagnosed psychotic, mm. right? I am out of the closet mm. as a diagnosed psychotic. Mm. That is one of the 
that is one of the deepest closets you can be in. Yeah. Uh, to come out and say, I'm a, in fact, one, one of our main opponents who's pushing for more forced drugging, she said, this comes down to the fact, do people have a right to be psychotic? Do they have a right to be psychotic? And it's like, you know, that's, that's what it comes down to. Um, Okay, well, uh, all right. So this society oh, oh, right. has a okay, soul so, sickness. You know, it's has, this society is psychotic. Hmm. You know? So, uh, the, I mean, the next question was <laughs> yeah. basically policy changes or definitions yeah. you see as necessary. All right, yeah. so it's not so much that people have a right to be psychotic. That's uh -huh. not the issue. The issue is, okay, people have a condition of soul sickness. So, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, I'm... I'm a maroon, black Indian. So uh -huh. for me, soul is not a, a, a religious term. It is a cultural condition. Right. It, it's basically an expression of having an awareness of your history, mm -hmm. your culture. I'm a musician. I'm a mm -hmm. songwriter. Mm -hmm. I hear voices. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they give yeah, me right. songs. <laughs> they give me new material. Right. I, you know, I write fiction. Mm -hmm. I write science fiction. I write prose. Mm -hmm. It's like you know, Alice Walker you know, mm -hmm. talks about the color purple and then you know, her other books. You know? mm -hmm. Lots of writers, creative people talk about, okay, there's this character in my head mm -hmm. that won't let go that dictated this book. Right. So is that crazy? Right. Am right. I crazy for you know <laughs> being a songwriter, hearing voices? Uh -huh. You know, I mean, no, they don't tell me to jump off bridges. Right. You know, uh, but uh -huh. again, what is a condition of health, soul mm -hmm. health, and then mental well-being? And right. you know, how yeah. how is it that you know because dealing with addictions, dealing with mm -hmm. co-occurring disorders, where you know the mental illnesses yeah. or those labels reinforce, you know, I'm not sure that it's an improvement to make people diabetic couch potatoes watching television. Yeah, you know, it, it, eight it, hours of the internet, that's, you know, and not when I was human so, interaction. When I was so, so, so called psychotic, I thought the TV was personally talking to me. So, I mean, if people out there personally think that we're talking to them, they're, they're experiencing what is my so-called psycho psychosis was. If you're in Europe, they have a bunch of peer support groups for hearing distressing voices hmm. all over Europe. Hmm. USA, Ron Unger is a local counselor. He's one of the few people to offer uh, help uh, that's non-drug for, quote, hearing distressing voices. Um, you know, I, I wanted to mention, uh, people, can, by the way, can go to our website, mindfreedom.org, uh, to find out a lot about this, mindfreedom.org. Yeah. Uh, but on there, uh, we have something where we talk about healing, normality, mad pride. Uh, Martin Luther King used to say uh, that psychologists have a word maladjusted. He's proud of being maladjusted that the salvation <laughs> of the world lies in the hands of the maladjusted. maladjusted. And he mm -hmm. called over and over again for the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. And it's like, <laughs> there it is. You know, in terms of spirituality and soul, and he recognized that we all share, you know, distress, all of us, you know, and that it's going to take creative maladjustment creative together. Maladjustment. Like mm -hmm. civil disobedience is mm -hmm. a classic example. Uh, nonviolent civil disobedience. Hmm. So, um, what would you think then? So, uh, w if this were policy, mm -hmm. you have an institute for creative maladjustment. <laughs> what what social policy look like? Let's start with <sighs> curriculum in schools. Right. Okay. Curriculum in schools ought to include uh, teaching people, reteaching them what we all know, which is how to mutually support one another. Emotional literacy. Emotional, good, emotional yeah. literacy. How to, okay. if you hear somebody weeping, now we're kind of like, oh my God, you're weeping. Uh, right. Where's the 911? Their school policy is actually yeah. where they won't let you comfort. You can't even hug somebody. <laughs> can't hug. Like in Springfield, right. you can't even hug a kid who's crying or whatever if you're right. another kid. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 uh, and ancient since ancient times, when somebody is in extreme weeping, you know, kind of state, like extreme overwhelming weeping, they tended to be more of a witness kind of uh, support, where mm. you're like witnessing something really important. 
you know, and we've kind of lost that. So teaching young people that they may experience extreme states yes. or an extremely different, extremely right. distressing, whichever it is, they may experience and it. And how to deal with how that to, with how skill. How to deal with it with skill, yeah. how to support one another. Uh, some, there's some good anti-suicide stuff happening on that. Uh, Damien Sands with Lane County mm -hmm. is out there hearing all sides on yeah. these issues, not just going for the Prozac, but right. looking for uh, emotional uh, literacy. And I think also making, um, making peer support widely available to all of Eugene is that, you know, we're, we're in the midst of an ecological catastrophe and a war. I mean, can we, can we look <laughs> like that? Can, we, can, can, can it actually Word look like that? If there was an earthquake yeah. right now, we'd be pouring out in the streets and hugging each other and right. helping each other. Can I see that, please? Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think I'd love to see massive nonviolent civil disobedience just get the musicians out of there and just flood the streets and nonviolently shut her down. That's what mm. I feel has to happen at this point. We're in that kind of emergency. Mm. Call me crazy. You won't be the first. <laughs> <laughs> but you're crazy with a Harvard degree. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I wouldn't be the first. How either. yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, well, how would you just deal with um, health disparities that, for example, that are often focus on minority and non-white cultural groups? Mm -hmm. I mean, because there's another, you know, I mean, this whole Western psychology thing, you know, mm -hmm. DSM talks about, you know, culturally formed, you know, constructs, not that it does a good job right. of it. Right, right. But... Yeah, you're referring to the, the label Bible, the Diagnostic and Statistical yes, Manual. Yes, right. I have the been label there. Bible, yeah, right. I've been there when they voted on it. Yeah. It's a few hundred primarily very rich white male American psychiatrists literally vote on what's normal. That document. <laughs> literally vote on They what's literally normal, vote on right? it. They yeah. literally vote. And that document has, has quasi legal status. It's yes, referenced it in our right. laws. Insurance. Very powerful. Right. Yeah. No, and, and so, you know what? The new label Bible is coming along. Right. And we're working with the, pre believe it or not, the president of the World Psychiatric Association, Juan Mezic is concerned about this. Hmm. He is an indigenous uh, South American Indian descent uh, psychiatrist. I'm not saying he's perfect, but we went to Germany to the World Psychiatric Association meeting. They had a big awareness about the horrible history of psychiatry and the Holocaust, that one of the first groups killed were uh, mentally disabled kids. Yes. Um, th right there in Dresden. I mean, I was very impressed uh, by this, and we met for three and a half hours with Dr. Mezich. We did a news conference, and this guy called for dialogue with groups like ours. He questioned the labeling. He said that we should have a strength-based description of people rather than this. Leave it to an Indian to do that. Exactly. So okay. we got to jump on. Uh, in fact, if people in Lane County want internships, volunteering, things like this, we will have you be working with people like. Uh, Dr. Mezich from World Psychiatric Association. Over at the World Health Organization, Dr. Sarah Chano is the head of the mental health section. Again, he sounds like us here mm. talking. Uh, the oppression is systemic. It's not like there's this head psychiatrist that's you know rubbing his hands saying, how can we hurt people? Yeah. It's a systemic thing, and some of the leadership in the psychiatric establishment knows there's a problem. Uh, in fact, we get grief from our more radical members when we meet with uh, yeah. meet with some of these folks. You would, of course. <laughs> right. So I would encourage folks to um, to to get involved in this because uh, the elite is writing the rules for our behavior with this kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, and um, we should be cha we should be questioning that. It's not so much like a conspiracy. I mean, that's not uh -huh. crazy to talk about that, but yeah. there is basically a exclusive social club that is writing the rules, and so yes. unless you're, you know, I mean, being an indigenous person, it's like, all right, well. I already know y'all are crazy. You uh -huh. think I'm crazy for wanting to be free, but right. no, there's there's human connections. There's yeah. looking at culture. There's you know other health contracts mm -hmm. structs that I've used with victims of school shootings where right. Western psychology had no answer. Right. You know how do how do you deal with a recurring nightmare where you you know your your family member is a victim of a school shooter and you have this recurring dream for a year and then it's revealed that 
that's accurate. How does right. Western psychology explain that? Right. It doesn't. Right. Well, there's an indigenous psychology that I use for, for helping that person say, okay, you needed to be able to calm these monsters that you see that uh -huh. are about to go off. Right. So, final thoughts. Right. Um, well, I would encourage people to be active in this. This is a mainstream issue, just like when I was in the peace movement here, the environmental movement, uh, saving old growth. Mental well-being is a mainstream issue. Mm. Uh, so get active in it. Speak yeah. out about it. You can check out our website, mindfreedom.org. Yeah. Uh, mindfreedom.org. And our uh, toll-free number is one eight seven seven mad pride uh, get involved get active in it uh, we have a mad pride movement we have mad pride events uh, so you know speak out about this uh, because this affects everybody uh, and I, I would like to see a nonviolent global revolution and I think that we ought to speak openly about it uh, and we might not succeed but let's let's try it hey thank you for coming thank David. you very much if you like what you've seen uh, feel free to uh, email us feedback Mm -hmm. uh, at live class at lanecc.edu and in the subject line basically say diversity TV feedback um, and maybe even if you want to request a particular topic for anything that's coming up in an upcoming season we'll be happy to do that um, so thank you David thank you. for uh, for being on the show uh, I'm Mark Harris this has been diversity TV We'll be rebroadcasting this show um, 10 o'clock on Friday, and we'll see you next week with a brand new show.